Hello, everybody. He put me on one half a second after I started saying hello, everybody. Okay. Here's you. Are going to learn to be more professional. That's what you're going to do. Sean voluntarily walked into the punishment room, sparing me the need to send him there. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. We run a taut ship at the Dennis Prager Show. Yes, indeed, my friends. Dennis Prager here. My guest is Robert Epstein, former editor-in-chief of Psychology Today, a visiting scholar at the University of California, San Diego, founder and director emeritus of the Cambridge Center for Behavioral Studies in Concord, Massachusetts. And where is he now? Robert Epstein, where are you now? Do we have Mr. Professor Epstein on? Hello? Hi, I'm, I'm here now, yes. Okay, great. Where are you now? I'm in uh, beautiful San Diego, California. Where you are a visiting scholar at UCSD. No, I did that for a long time, but uh, now I'm senior research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology. And where is that? That is in the San Diego area. Okay. Well, welcome to my show. I'm Dennis Prager. It's a pleasure to have you, sir. If I'm... It's a pleasure to be on. I, I was actually on your show uh, two years ago for a full hour when you had a guest host on. A guest host on. I don't know if that counts, though, since you That's there. funny. Yes. This, this was one of these great riddles of life. Yeah. Was I on this host's <laughs> show if the host wasn't on his own show? Exactly. Right. <laughs> That's a good one. All right. So, sir, you have done research on Google searches, and I'd like you to share it with my listeners. Well, sure, yes. I've been researching uh, all kinds of new methods of online influence the Internet has made possible. Uh, my first discovery was of something called SEME, S-E-M-E, the Search Engine Manipulation Effect, which is the impact that a biased search results have on opinions and votes. Uh, when I first started doing experiments on this, which was uh, more than six years ago, I thought the impact would be very small. It turns out <clears throat> the impact is it's enormous. It's one of the largest uh, behavioral effects ever discovered in the behavioral sciences. Uh, and I published uh, my first report on this effect in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. That was in 2015. And that report has since been accessed or downloaded more than 200,000 times. And that's, that's a lot for a scientific paper. And since then, I've discovered about seven other effects. These effects are so powerful uh, that if they're in the hands of people who have uh, particular political leanings, uh, together they can shift upwards of 15 million votes in a presidential election uh, without anyone knowing that they're being manipulated and without leaving a paper trail for authorities to trace. Wow. So give me a, a real-life example. Well, sure. Uh, in 2016, I actually set up the first ever uh, project to monitor the search results that Google, Bing, and Yahoo were showing uh, users prior to the election when they conducted election-related searches. Uh, and I found that the search results were strongly biased in favor of Hillary Clinton, uh, whom I supported, by the way. I am not a conservative. Uh, and so they shifted votes, lots of votes, away from Donald Trump toward Hillary Clinton, but in a way that people couldn't see. Because the way this works is people trust and click on uh, search results that are higher in the list. So 50% of all clicks go to the top two items in the wow, list. Wow, wow. Oh. Sure, and what Google was doing was putting items high in the list that led people to web pages 
uh, that looked that made Hillary Clinton look a lot better than Donald Trump, and over time that shifts the opinions and votes of undecided voters. And of course, in close elections, it's undecided voters who determine the winner. In this particular case, we calculated based on the bias that we found. Uh, that Google could quite easily have shifted two to three million votes toward Hillary Clinton just using this manipulation uh, without anyone knowing that they were doing it. And this was published by the National Academy of Sciences. Yes, I mean, not only that, I mean, it's, you know, I've been invited in by, by scientific groups around the world to talk about this work. It's a, that, that effect has already been replicated by one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany. This is real. This is huge. And that was only the first discovery I made. I mean, there's a lot more going on than just uh, this this effect, which is called seam, there's a lot more going on besides that. I mean, this is this is a new world, an entirely new world of influence and manipulation. All right. Hold it there for a moment. This is truly, truly significant. Robert Epstein, I will describe him in my, how I see him in a moment, but what he says is critical. I'll be back with Professor Epstein in a moment. Robert Epstein is a senior research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research. He's had a paper, at least one that I know of, published by the National Academy of Sciences. He's a professor, he's a professor a visiting scholar at the University of California, San Diego, former editor of Psychology Today. I remember when Psychology Today started. It's, it's been there for a while. So, Professor Epstein has done research and he voted for Hillary Clinton so I, I I need you to know by the way so let me get this let me get the elephant out of the room and uh, or at least acknowledge his presence it obviously adds tremendously to your credibility that you did support Hillary Clinton and yet you are reporting the bias of Google is that fair to say well yes because the issues here uh you know, go far beyond our, our particular politics. Of, I mean, Google is impacting the the opinions and purchases and beliefs and votes of two and a half billion people around the world. Yes. So uh, I just want you to know, you don't even have to react, though you're certainly welcome to. You, I, I put you in the category of an elite group, liberals who are not on the left or liberals who are not leftists. I, I think that, again, all of us, including you, by the way, we all need to, for this issue, this issue is so profoundly important, I can give you numbers that would make your head spin, that we need to put our politics aside, honestly, and just look at this this scary, frightening new world of online influence, which is completely controlled by two companies who are not accountable to the public. Uh, I mean, this is... What are the, wait, what, what are the, what are the two companies, yeah. Google and who? Facebook. Okay. Uh, but Google has more, a lot more power to, to influence opinion than Facebook does. But the two of them, if they, if they are aligned in supporting the yeah. same product or the same party or the same candidate, uh, it's, it's, I mean... They again. They can shift millions of votes using what they themselves call ephemeral experiences. In other words, things like news feeds and search suggestions uh, and search results, answer boxes. These are ephemeral because they appear only for a second or two. They affect your thinking. They disappear. They're not stored anywhere. No one can go back in time and retrace them. And Google employees, and you know, we've seen in leaks recently, they are they are well aware that they can use ephemeral experiences to shift votes and opinions, and they do this deliberately. I've I've proven it with my monitoring projects. So this this uh, it doesn't matter what one's politics are. I mean, there's a new film out called The Creepy Line, which was produced by uh, Peter Schweitzer, who's become a good friend of mine, and uh, you know. He, you know, he said, "Can I? I mean, can I interview you for this 
in film, I said, uh, I said, sure. So this film actually talks a lot about my research, even though a lot of the people in the film are conservatives, uh, because, again, uh, the issues should have nothing to do with, with our politics. I mean, right now, Google is favoring Democrats. I mean, next week, who knows who they could favor? You see, you can't, you can't, You've got to put politics aside here. And by the way, there are people on the left, on the left and the right in Congress who are recognizing how important this is. Who on the left is? Uh, on the left, you got people like uh, B- uh, Blumenthal. Uh, there, there are several uh, on the left, and of course, quite a few on the right. Now, that having said that. Congress is not going to help us much on this issue. That's why that's why what you do is so important because because as you know right now these companies are helping Democrats so the Democrats don't really want to do anything except talk. Uh so so Elizabeth Warren for example has come up with a proposal for uh, breaking up these companies because she sees them as a threat to democracy which they are. But her proposal has no teeth at all. I published a piece in USA Today just, just tearing her proposal apart. Uh, but, but, and people, uh, the conservatives in Congress, they don't like regulation. So, you know, we're just, uh, we're just really stuck here in the U.S. The, the EU is being much more aggressive in taking on these companies. They recognize the threat. They think these are American companies, which they are, and so they're being much more aggressive. Are you familiar with StartPage.com? I I am StartPage's biggest fan, uh, and and of course that's an alternative to Google, which no one should ever ever use. You should never use Google.com. It's, and it gives excellent search results without tracking you. So I've I've sent tens of thousands of people to StartPage. Uh, I have I have a uh, an essay online that's very easy to find. It's called Seven Simple Steps Toward Online Privacy, which I just updated, by the way. Where is that uh, findable? And, yeah. uh, well, if you do Seven Simple Steps and, and just my last name, Epstein, or Seven Simple Steps Privacy, but don't Google it. <laughs> don't Google it. <laughs> that's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Okay, startpage.com. We'll be back in a moment. The Dennis Prager Show. And the Prager store is having its twice-a-year sale on 20 years of courses I've taught on that. And it's uh, it's, it's life-changing, I I feel hesitant, because I did it saying it, but it is. It's available at the Prager store, and you'll get also a free copy signed of uh, my next volume of The Rational Bible. Robert Epstein... This is a very is doing very important work that even the search engine of Google is biased politically, and he himself is a Democrat and supported the person that he showed they're biased in favor of. But he's a good man because he cares about truth. I don't care if you voted for Hillary Clinton. I care if you care about truth. And he does. So how does Google respond to your scientifically based research? Well, they uh, Google pays, uh, unfortunately, um, and my wife would agree with this statement, unfortunately, Google pays very close attention to everything I do. Uh, the head of Google Search even published a long article uh, and they've never done this. They've never done this to anybody. Uh, in Politico, uh, just criticizing me and my research. Now, they didn't actually say anything specifically about my research that was wrong because my research is, uh, you know, is, is meticulous and, you know, and is, is beyond, I would say beyond uh, reproach. But, the point is that yes, Google pays close attention. They're 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 not happy with me um, at all. And there is an alternative, StartPage.com. I just learned about it today, but my producer's been using it for a while. And you're a big uh, enthusiast. They don't track you. Oh, I haven't had a a, a targeted ad uh, since 2014. So there there are ways to use the internet that just most people don't know about. Uh, you know, you, you must not use Google.com. You must not use Gmail. 
I, I mean, because all Gmails what are mail, what mail, what, the, all right, what Right. What mail program do you use? Uh, well, I've actually switched over to Proton Mail. Proton Mail is based in Switzerland, subject to very strict Swiss privacy laws. Okay. Uh, the ba- basic service all right. is free. All right. We're going to yeah. do a part two. Sir, I-, I admire you and your courage. I thank you. Robert Epstein and his seven steps are up at DennisPrager.com. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain Free Studio. There were 36,525 days in the 20th century. Of these, none was more consequential than June 6, 1944, D-Day, the Allied invasion of Normandy in Nazi-occupied France. It did not end World War II, but without it, the Nazi war machine would not and could not have been defeated. We, of course, know the good guys. America, England and its allies won. But in 1944, there was no certainty of success. In fact, there was just as much doubt as confidence. Winston Churchill's senior advisor, Field Marshal Brooke, wrote in his diary, I am very uneasy about the whole operation. It may well be the most ghastly disaster of the whole war. Brooke's fears were entirely reasonable. First, there were tens of thousands of men and millions of tons of material and supplies that had to be moved 100 miles across one of the roughest bodies of water in the world, the English Channel, and it had to be kept secret. If the Germans knew where and when the Allies were landing, they could mass forces against them and turn the beaches of northern France into killing fields. To prevent this, the Allies took every possible precaution. Their air forces destroyed bridges, roads and railways that might be used by the Germans to rush troops to the invasion site. Everyone knew the attack was coming. The key was to keep the Germans guessing. Fake radio chatter was broadcast to suggest the beaches near Calais would be the landing point. Double agents leaked fake details of units forming in southeast England, and movie set designers built phony tanks, planes and ships to support the ruse of an army preparing to cross near Dover for the benefit of German reconnaissance pilots and spies. The Germans swallowed it all. But the Nazis were not the only enemy the Allied forces faced. Mother Nature was just as threatening. The 23,000 paratroopers and glider-borne infantry jumping into Normandy needed moderate winds to be effective. The 12,000 Allied aircraft needed clear skies. The invasion fleet of 6,000 vessels needed calm seas, and there had to be a low tide to expose Nazi obstacles and mines. When high winds and rain began pummeling the Channel, Allied Supreme Commander General Dwight Eisenhower postponed the invasion date of June 5th by 24 hours. That might not sound like a significant delay, but it was. All forces were concentrated and ready to go. All the plans, all the deceptions could be exposed at any moment. Then came a new forecast. The weather appeared to be breaking. There might be a 12-hour window of opportunity. Eisenhower gave the order, we go. Immediately, the greatest invasion fleet ever assembled set sail. On board were over 130,000 young soldiers. Consider for a moment who these soldiers were. The average age of the American GIs was 21. Most had never seen combat or even been 50 miles from their hometown. As they sailed to the French shoreline, Eisenhower wrote a press release in case of catastrophe. D-Day was an all-or-nothing affair. A new invasion strategy would take months, if not years, to devise. The initial battle reports were seriously troubling. At Omaha Beach, overlooked by cliffs honeycombed with trenches, cannon and machine guns, the Americans took heavy losses. I might have killed hundreds that morning, reflected German soldier Hein Severlo manning one of the bunkers. The rough surf also took its toll. Dr. Hal Baumgarten, with the US Army's 116th Infantry, remembered, some of the fellows were pulled under by their wet combat jackets and heavy equipment. We couldn't help, they just drowned. Further along, army rangers took heavy casualties as they scaled the cliffs under intense gunfire. However, by midday, with US naval support, the Germans, low on supplies and ammunition, began to fold. 
Nazi reinforcements, including hundreds of tanks, which might have made all the difference, were not ordered to Normandy until the afternoon. Before the Germans could mount an effective counterattack, the Allies had secured all five landing beaches. Churchill had expected 20,000 to be killed on D-Day. Fortunately, heavy though they were, the losses were much lower. Of the 156,000 Allied personnel who hit the beaches that day, 10,000 became casualties. Of these, 5,000 were killed. No one died in vain. Their sacrifice meant an end to Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Another year of bitter fighting lay ahead, but D-Day, June 6, 1944, was a pivotal step on the road to forever removing the Nazi tyranny from Europe and the world. I'm Peter Caddick Adams, author of Sand and Steel, A New History of D-Day, for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. Hi everybody, I'm Dennis Prager. Before I get to my guest, I want to tell you some of the reasons I'm having him on. It's, a, it's the latest book on D-Day. It's the 75th anniversary of D-Day, the invasion of France, which began the liberation of Europe from Nazism, crossing the English Channel, largest such invasion in history. And so on the 75th anniversary, this major, major, major new history has come out. Secondly, I have been doing extremely well with British historians, which is, I feel bad because I'm sort of putting my guest on the spot here, <laughs> telling him how good all these British historians have been on my show. By the way, we do have it, and we do have a PragerU video of him up this week on a D-Day. The him is Peter Caddick Adams, a lecturer in military history and current defense issues at the Defense Academy of the United Kingdom. The book is Sand and Steel, The D-Day Invasion and the Liberation of France. I visited Normandy and the graves there many years ago. It was life-changing for me. I made a vow that if these people could die uh, for liberty, in many cases for America, uh, I could at least devote my life to liberty and the American ideal. So, Peter Caddick Adams, first of all, congratulations on your book. Second, congratulations on your PragerU video. Dennis, thank you. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, sir. Why have I had such good fortune with British historians? And don't don't feel that it's a it's not a a cute question. It's very I'm very serious about it. Uh, 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 is there a tradition of his of historical research that you folks uh, seem to adhere to? Because in America, a lot of history departments have been taken over by ideology. Uh, is is that true in Britain? Um, I think for some people there's, there's an ideology, uh, and I think for a, a lot of us um, who saw the leftward drift in the 1960s and 1970s, um, there was a sense of needing to push back, of setting particularly military history um, in its proper context, uh, and now looking back on World War II uh, and just really understanding that it was inevitable and necessary and right that the sacrifices we made um, uh, were, were given and last all the way through to this day. That's, the, that's really the proof of what we achieved in World War II, that we still have freedom and liberty today. That is entirely true. Tell me, no, I don't know the answer to this. What were the national percentages of the in, of the invading troops? What percentage? Well, that's a very interesting question yeah. because mm -hmm. um, we've been left with the idea, the perception, 
that this was on D-Day itself, 6th June 1944, an overwhelmingly American effort. And I think on June 7th it was, but on June 6th, uh, most of the fleet is British. The slight majority of ground troops are British and Canadians. Um, and in the Air Force, most of the air frames are manufactured in the United States. But a lot of the air crew, I won't say all of them, I won't even say a majority, probably half and half, are, are Brits and Canadians um, versus Americans. But Eisenhower really summed it up in his memoirs, and he said, you know, on D-Day, there was only one nation, and that was Allied. And I think that's the ingredient of the success. I'm glad I asked that, because I... I now... Why did you say on June 7th it was American? The, the, the Brits particularly have a finite supply of manpower, resources, and logistics. Uh, and, of course, America has been gearing up. Um, uh, and there is a huge backlog of trained combat troops ready to go to Europe. Uh, and so, if you like... June 6th is the tip of the spearhead, and that unleashes the, the floodgates. Once you've made a successful landing in Normandy, then the floodgates of Amer American manpower can then cross the Atlantic, cross the channel from the United Kingdom, and carry the fight through. And well, the see. vast majority of troops right. fire, uh, fighting are, uh, are, are American by the end of 1944. I, I, I don't know if you could even answer this, but statistically, and you may not be able because it's an odd way perhaps of asking it, but statistically, in the first waves of the invasion of the beaches there, what were your what was your statistical likelihood of not drowning before you even got to the beach and uh, not being a casualty on the beach? That is not, not wounded or killed. Okay, well, we know that 15% of the assault wave drown before anyone has even shot at them. Um, we, 156,000 people land during the course uh, of the day, uh, and m nearly all of the casualties, uh, and we think now that the accurate number of killed on D-Day is around 4,400. Um, but that's a very, very small percentage of the overall 156,000. Um, uh, and nearly all of those casualties are in the assault wave in the first two hours. Mm -hmm. So if you survive the first two hours, mm -hmm. you are more likely to survive the whole day. Mm -hmm. What? But in terms of, of tying it down to percentages, I think that's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. The, your answer was, was perfectly legit. By the way, the, the 15 per, what does that mean? 15% of the entire invading troop drowned? 15% of the assault wave who die, die from drowning. Oh, I see. Okay, good. Being, okay, now I get it. Yeah, okay. Rather than gunshot wounds. Right. Was that expected, or was that a surprise? It's inevitable because of the poor weather, and if you remember, D-Day was postponed by Eisenhower for 24 hours because mm -hmm. the weather was so appalling. The planners expected over 20,000 deaths from D-Day. So actually we come out of this very lightly compared with the worst forecasts mm -hmm. and 5,000 of those deaths, in other words 25% would have been from drowning. So, uh, so as I said that, that, much, much, yeah, that was expected. Much there was the, the reason I ask is were, were, did the ones who drown, were they capable of swimming or they were, it was so heavy their gear that even if you could swim you drowned? Dennis, it's, it's the gear. You've absolutely nailed it there. Um, they are so heavily laden um, that uh, whether or not um, they can swim, whether or not they're close to the shore, if you fall over, you've just got so much gear on. And, of course, the moment it becomes wet, it almost doubles in weight, and you just can't get up. And your buddies can't help you because they themselves are struggling up the beach. And oh, the instructions God. don't stop for anyone. Oh, my God. Uh, that, that's a very terrible uh, thing to, uh, to imagine in one's mind. 
your buddy has just fallen over, and that means inevitable death, and it's a terrible death, one might add. I mean, because the, the, you concentrate as well on the human element here, and I think that that's a big one. The uh, So I, I guess just the way it works in war, you're on the you're, you're you're invading Normandy Beach, and the you're you don't assume you'll be killed. I mean that's just otherwise nobody I guess could fight. You just assume it'll be the other guy. I mean is that is that the mentality of someone going into war? That's absolutely right. Um, I've worn uniform myself for thirty five years, no longer, but I've been in Iraq, Bosnia, Afghanistan. Uh, And I've interviewed a 1,000 veterans who fought in the D-Day campaign. And they all say that it's going to be someone else. When you're young, when you're 18, when you're that age, death is something that happens to old people, to pets, to your grandparents. It's not going to happen to you. You're indestructible. That's right. Hold on there, please. I want to just tell everybody about the book, the latest and... uh... Andrew Roberts says it's great, so it's great. (laughs) I will be reading it. And it is just, it's just come out, 75th anniversary of D-Day. And the book is Sand and Steel, up at DennisPrager.com. The Dennis Prager Show. Hi, everybody. A reminder to you about the critical elections upcoming in the United States. How much will be on the uh, ballot? This is AMAC reminding you about all of this, including nationalization of health care in the United States called Medicare for All. And, of course, uh, even the program would be open to everyone, even the children of illegal immigrants, even illegal immigrants themselves, according to many of the Democrats. Where is AARP on all of this, they want you to ask. They ask you, that is, AMAC. So that's some of the things you should think about if you join either turning 50 years of age. So I advise you to do what we have done here, join AMAC. It will fight hard against the nationalization of medicine and give you major benefits at the same time. PragerForAMAC.com. 855-624-0163, PragerForAMAC.com, 855-624-0163. We lost our guest for some reason. Does anybody know why? We did. Anyway, my guest is in the United Kingdom. Peter Caddick Adams, lecturer in military history and current defense issues at the Defense Academy of the United Kingdom. It's the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and his book is coming out exactly within weeks of that. There's a great PragerU video on D-Day there. No, we really do, we teach everything, and it's not just advocacy of our value system. We just want people to know things. That's why I, I'm, I'm serious when I say if you're, your kid didn't go to college and watched our 400 videos and did the readings associated with them, they would have a much better education than in almost any university. Obviously, we don't teach medicine or engineering. So this is the, the D-Day book. It is titled... Uh, it is titled Sand and Steel. Do we have our uh, professor back up? Does anybody know? How did we lose him? Did uh, Just disconnected? Nope. I'm not, uh, he's not there yet. How, does the, how do these things happen? Do you get disconnected as often as I get disconnected? <laughs> I, I think about D-Day a lot, actually. I mentioned to you before how deeply I was affected by my visit to Normandy. All right, Professor, I don't know how we lost you, but we did. So now, I'm sorry, but I'm back here. Yeah. Now, may you may, maybe that we're sorry. We don't know yet who's sorry. But anyway, thank you. Uh, so we're talking about uh, about the day, obviously, and your book. So I have to ask you uh, the uh, an an obvious question. So many books have been written on D-Day. Why another one? 
we were coming up to the 75th anniversary, but for me, it was also a personal voyage of discovery. I first went to the beaches in 1975 when I was 14, and I met veterans. And ever since then, I've met that wonderful age group of people who were able and willing to talk to me. Um, and so, really, it was researching partly what they did, and I uncovered so many new things. I felt with the 75th anniversary, I had to put pen to paper. Uh, and so that was the story of sand and steel. Okay, that's fair. I read, by, by, by coincidence, about a year ago, I read a book. I don't even know how I found it, but I, re- I read it, actually listened to it. And that was something to the effect, D-Day through uh, German eyes. Are you familiar with any of those? There are very few of them. What it was like to be one of the Nazi soldiers. Yeah, and I've made it my business to talk to as many Germans as possible about what it was like to be on the other side of the beach. And the fascinating thing is that many of them were taken prisoner. They were shipped to the United States uh, in prisoner of war pens. They stayed afterwards, married local girls, and became American citizens. More of my German interviewees were residents and citizens in the United States. And I felt very comfortable interviewing them because they had objectivity. They understood both sides of the fence and both sets of values. And what did you learn from them? They realized how much they had been hoodwinked by an authoritarian regime uh, and lied to. They also realized how little training and preparation they had. So your average Allied soldier was 21 had had at least one full year of combat training in preparation for June 6th. The average German age was 30. Uh, Many of them had only a month's training before the invasion happened, and very few of them had fired shots in anger or had ready combat experience. The steely-eyed Nazi killers who arrive in Normandy as soon as the invasion has begun, they're a different kettle of fish. But the garrison of invaders wondering when or whether the invasion will ever happen um, in quite a lazy backwater that was Normandy before June 6th, they are a different class, old, unfit, often recovering from wounds from other campaigns. So there's a huge mismatch between the Allies' young, keyed-up, wiry, extraordinarily well-trained on the German defenders. The Nazis were fooled, is that correct? The Nazis were also fooled. We couldn't fool them that there wasn't going to be an invasion. Everybody knew in the summer of 1944 an invasion would come to France somewhere. But they didn't know exactly where, and they didn't know what day, what time. So what we could do is fool them into uh, mislocating their reserves, which they put further along the coast, uh, and we concealed the time as as much as we could. Uh, And so we attacked, actually, as it turned out, in in bad weather. But the training is incredibly important, and one of the the unique things I discovered that no historian really has uh, hit on before was that more soldiers were killed in training before D-Day than on the actual day itself. That's astonishing. That's that's astonishing. astonishing. I don't even understand. It is horrible, of course. I I don't even understand it, though. What type of training would kill thousands? It's What you have is lots of small units, battalions of men of 500 to 800 strong. And in the course of the previous year, they all go through very realistic assault training. And each loses maybe 10 to 20 men mishandling grenades, uh, treading on mines, uh, mishandling explosives, uh, drowning in the surf, uh, gunshot wounds. And because... Okay, hold hold, hold it there, please. Hold it there. This is, again, it's all fascinating. The book is Sand and Steel, The D-Day Invasion and the Liberation of France. 
Peter Caddick Adams. We continue. I'm Dennis Prager. The Dennis Prager Show. 75th anniversary of D-Day. The invasion of the European continent. Troops coming from England surprised the Germans, the Nazis, and began the end of World War II because the liberation of France started it, Um, at least on the West. The author of this major new history is Peter Caddick Adams. Lecture in Military History in the United Kingdom. The book is Sand and Steel, The D-Day Invasion and the Liberation of France. If there were no D-Day invasion, would the Russians have defeated the Nazis on their own? What a good question. The, we have to remember that uh, four-fifths of the German armed forces in 1944 are on the Eastern Front fighting the Russians. And we have to remember that 90% of the German casualties in World War II are sustained fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front. So the question is, once the Russians capture Berlin, would they have carried on? Would they have carried on into the West? Would they have stopped at the Atlantic? Um, The West didn't have an option of not invading uh, Normandy because the Russians are bleeding. They've lost so many men in their battles with the Nazi war machine. We had always promised them, right from the word go, that we would sooner or later take our take the weight, um, put in our share of, of manpower and logistics and fight the war. I think if we had never launched the invasion, the communist hostility would have been so strong that they would not have stopped uh, when they'd beaten the Germans. They would have turned on us because they would have assumed that uh, we were prepared to sit back uh, and let the communists take all the casualties. So we felt duty-bound uh, to uh, to make an effort because up until then, the, the Russians seemed to have been taking all the casualties. But I think there was the longer-term fear. Um, that we need to make sure the Russians don't simply carry on into France uh, and become a different kind of threat, because the Soviet doctrine we knew from the 20s and 30s was to export communism around the world. And that was still a fear. So D-Day, in effect, if I hear you correctly, liberated France and Western Europe from Nazism and communism. There was a very real fear of communism. Um, no one, I think, could say that politically at the time. But the net result, the obvious result is, is Nazism right. removed. The net result is that communism is not going to take root in Western Europe. And they try. Believe me, they try. So that, it's incredibly important. It's the game-changing day of the 20th century, if you like Was Stalin happy about D-Day? Stalin didn't believe that we would do it. When we did, he thought the effort would be minuscule. Um, He was always ready to be suspicious of the West. So when we launch it on the scale we do, there is a grudging admiration for what the West is doing. And when East meets West in April 1945, there is a great admiration for, for what the Western allies have done and have driven as far as they do um, almost to Berlin. Um, but at the political level, Stalin never lets his guard down right. uh, and remains suspicious. Right. Well, he was, he was known as somewhat paranoid. Did D-Day, in light of the surprise with regard to the to the Nazis and their response... Did D-Day have a deflating effect at all on German high command? They are, the Germans are, they're expecting an invasion. Um, and actually, initially, they are very optimistic because their top general, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, uh, has been employed and sent to the West. And, and he is a figurehead, a propaganda 
figurehead because he's done so well against the British in the past in North Africa. Uh, and their view is that if anyone can defeat the invasion, it, it's going to be Rommel. Okay, hold it there, if you will. I know you don't have this on the BBC, but on the other hand, we have different views in the BBC. We have private radio. We'll be back in a moment. The book, Sand and Steel, is up at DennisPrager.com. 1-8-Prager-776. Seventy-fifth anniversary of D-Day. Major, major new book about D-Day out. From a British historian, which is generally self-recommending in my experience. So how many I think of British historians. Peter Caddick Adams, lecturer in military history at the Defense Academy of the United Kingdom. The book is Sand and Steel, The D-Day Invasion and the Liberation of France. And he also teaches the newest Prager University video, D-Day. It's got two million views in three days. By the way, is your book coming out in Audible? Um, that's the plan. My last book was uh, about the Ardennes Battle, the Battle of the Bulge. Um, we produced an audio book very quickly uh, after the launch of the e-book uh, and the, the proper paper book. So Good. Uh, on the horizon, I think we've got an audible. All right, excellent. You were t- so I asked you, was the German high command deflated psychologically in any way because of D-Day? And then you were talking about Rommel, and so continue. And so Rommel is there as the German commander because he is their, um, he's their most revered leader in battle. And the German view is that if anyone can defeat the Allies when the invasion comes, it will be Rommel. Uh, and so they're looking forward to the invasion because the, the propaganda that the Germans have been fed is that they will overcome the opposition. And they're fed all sorts of lies about how appalling, uh, how appallingly equipped the Allies are. Um, and so the message that the high command have when they hear the invasion goes in, um, they feel gr- at long last great. This is the moment of decision. And they feel that they are well-equipped enough to overcome the Allied military machine. Don't forget, a little earlier in the year at Anzio, we've had a stalemate. And the battles in the Mediterranean on Sicily and Italy at Salerno have almost resulted in the Allies being pushed back into the sea. So the Germans have a lot of good grounds for optimism that they will prevail. Oh, I did not know that. That's very interesting. So they they don't they did not come to regard D Day as a defeat. Oh, they do. But the moment they hear the troops are ashore, um, they are optimistic. These are the high commanders, and for the first few days, the picture to them is confused. Uh, and don't forget, the first reports that go back from Omaha Beach are that we have pushed the invaders back into the sea. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Hitler lives in a bizarre world in his mountaintop retreat in Bavaria, and he pays attention to what he wants to hear. And often the news is dressed up uh, to be something acceptable to him. He doesn't like bad news. So the message that is being fed to the, the, the German leader, Adolf Hitler, is initially that the invasion will uh, be defeated. So there's no initial deflation. I'm going to read some questions from listeners only to save time, but I still want their input. So I'm saying this to you, my listeners. So in Tucson, Arizona, Robert asks, who was responsible for landing the troops on D-Day at high tide and why? Okay, so the big debate is, is high tide or low tide? At low tide, you expose all the obstacles that Rommel's men have planted um, if you land at high tide, you, you go over the obstacles closer to the German defences. You, uh, you have a much shorter distance to run along the, the, the beach. Um, but uh, what you don't want to do is lose all your landing craft. So they land at low tide. Um, and, of course, there's that horrible long run across the sands of many hundreds of metres. Uh, and that provides all the casualties on Omaha Beach. So 
uh, there is a debate between the two, uh, and that is why we land at low tide uh, on all the beaches to save to save the uh, the the sea craft the 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 boats. Uh, yes, to save to save the, the the landing barges, and it sounds quite brutal. But, of course, if all the landing barges are destroyed by obstacles because we land at high tide, they can't go back and provide any more men. Um, they can't go back to the big assault ships and bring further people in. So we need the landing barges. We've only got a certain number of them. Why and, and is it... Why, okay. Forgive me. Why is it my impression that the air, the air attack was not successful? Is that just an error on my part? No, you're, you're absolutely right, Dennis. We send huge numbers of heavy and medium bombers to bomb the German defenses just before the troops arrive. Uh, and what happens is they're very nervous about bombing their own people. Uh, and because of the poor weather, because of low cloud, they decide to delay dropping the bombs by two or three seconds. That's all it is. But two or three seconds, when you're at 8,000 feet, traveling at three to 500 miles an hour, means that the bombs are dropped two to three miles inland instead of on the German bunkers along the shore. And that's why the bombing is a failure. All the German defenses are completely untouched. So how do you account for such a, a if I may use the word, mistake? The air crew themselves who are notes of bombing their own kind, their own... Right, but wait, I'm, I don't uh, understand. Kids. I thought they were sent before the men got out to the beaches. So they're, they're sent at, at the, they're to bomb literally minutes just before so that the defenders are having to keep their heads down as the guys get out of their landing barges. And that's why the timing is crucial. So the only thing that destroys or keeps the heads down um, of the defenders is actually the seaborne uh, bombardment from the battleships offshore. So first of all, there's an aerial bombardment. There's a sea, uh, a naval bombardment that goes in at the same time. That's a little more successful. Um, but you're absolutely right in saying the airborne uh, bombing part of the uh, campaign on June 6th is a failure. That's very sad. See, I always been troubled by that. Steel, sand and steel, up at DennisPrager.com. Yes, and especially your, your children who probably know nothing about it should see it. He is the man I have this hour, another wonderful British historian, Brit Peter Caddick Adams. Teaches at the Defense Academy of the United Kingdom. The book is Sand and Steel, the D-Day Invasion and the Liberation of France. And we're talking about the, the, the tragedy of the, the airborne attack on D-Day. So I am to understand that the pilot's fear of dropping bombs on, the, on their own invading forces is what primarily caused them to be off target? That's e exactly right, Dennis. Um, and we have to remember that down below are brothers of the air crew who are flying over them. Um, everybody is closely knit. Uh, and the, the fear of today what we would call friendly fire casualties is so overwhelming that the tactical decision is taken just by a very few pilots, the lead pilots, just, just delay for a few seconds. Uh, and if the first guys delay and everybody else follows, you then find that the, um, all the bombers end up bombing inland instead of along the coast. Was this foreseen? No, I, it's one of the very few parts of the invasion itself that goes wrong it hadn't been foreseen uh, and we have to say that most other aspects go extraordinarily well so um the the ground troops are very annoyed when they look around for the craters they have all been promised and none of them are there the bomb craters um 
But at the end of the day, the net result is we, we still manage to make it ashore and we still manage to capture the five beachheads. It's a harder fight than it would otherwise have been. And finally, is who who is the or who are the military heroes or political heroes of D-Day? Every man who steps ashore is a hero in my eyes, everyone associated with D-Day. But if we have to pick out one man, um, it's the future president, Dwight David Eisenhower. He's the man who has to make the decision to mm -hmm. commit these men, in some cases, to their deaths. Um, it's not an easy decision when he makes it uh, on, uh, on June 4th initially and then confirms it on June 5th. Uh, he knows exactly what's at stake. Um, but he has the moral courage to make the difficult call uh, when it's needed. He doesn't fudge the issue. Right. Um, All right. And My friend, it has been a joy to uh, speak with you. Your video is great and your book is great. The book is up at DennisPrager.com.